Hello again, friends. We are going to uh, spend the next few videos talking about some of the lower yield infectious diseases. Now, when I say lower yield, I'm talking about step two and three. If you're taking step one, um, this may be pertinent information, very pertinent information for you, especially as I get to talking about the pathology. So I'm going to try to combine this um, so it'll be pertinent for everybody. But uh, for those of you taking step two and three, really hone in here on what makes each of these fungal disorders that we're going to talk about unique and the treatment. That's going to be super pertinent for step two and three. They're not going to go too far in depth into these. You're just going to need to know this at the surface level. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you very much who have already donated. And certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel and you'll get updates as I put more and more videos up. Just tap the little box, hit the subscribe button. Okay, so we're going to talk about fungal disorders here. Most of these affect the lungs. However, one of them is going to be really important, especially as we go forward talking about HIV AIDS. And these are what we're going to be talking about. Okay, so aspergillosis is pretty much exclusively a disease of the immunosuppressed with one small exception. And the cause is aspergillus species, namely aspergillus fumigatus. Uh, these patients are almost always immunosuppressed, at least when it becomes an invasive disease, as we're going to see, that's a pretty common theme. Uh, however, one way that this tends to come up on the exam is that you've got a patient with asthma or cystic fibrosis, and they get a worsening of their symptoms. And this is called allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, or ABPA. So it causes very similar allergic-like symptoms, uh, but they... Don't, they, they're either new or they don't respond properly to their normal medication. So for instance, asthma. Uh, they may experience a worsening uh, of their asthma over the course of several weeks. Um, so ABPA will have asthma-like symptoms. You know what all those are, but they may have a fever on top of that. Look for a patient with a history of uh, just regular old asthma or cystic fibrosis. Mycetoma is asymptomatic. It's a little fungal ball. It can happen in immunocompetent people. Um, if they grow big enough, they can cause hemoptysis, but I doubt that's going to come up on your exam. Invasive pulmonary aspergillosis is a really, really, really bad pneumonia. Um, and what happens then is that the fungus gets into the blood and it seeds other organs, namely, particularly here, we're talking about the CNS and the skin. So on the skin, you can get these pustular-like lesions. I don't know, I don't, yeah, I don't think I have a picture here, unfortunately. Uh, but you can look up aspergillosis of the skin and you'll see what this looks like. So when you have a pneumonia-like picture and skin lesions, you really should be thinking fungal. And when we're talking about immunosuppressed people, think aspergillosis. Now, the first thing you're going to be doing is getting a chest x-ray, or you can just jump to CT, but you should probably go for chest x-ray first. And that's just because when these patients come in, they have a fever and a cough. And so what's the first thing we think of on our differential? Community-acquired pneumonia. And that, your first step is always going to be to get a chest x-ray. No different here. Um, what you're going to find is if you get a CT early on, you may see the halo sign. Later on, you may see the crescent sign. I'm going to show you what the crescent sign looks like. You can look up the halo sign on your own. We tend not to suspect aspergillosis. When I say aspergillosis, I mean disseminated aspergillosis in immunocompetent patients. It just doesn't happen. Uh, so the test of choice to really nail down the diagnosis of aspergillosis, if you're suspecting it based on radiology, is to get a bronchoalveolar lavage, or you can get serum antigen testing. Either of those are okay. This is a mycetoma right here. You can kind of see it right there. Um, and then right here, what you see is the crescent sign. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. And so what you see is this sort of little fungus ball here, and then you see this kind of wall here, and then this, this kind of black area surrounding it looks kind of like a crescent moon. That is the crescent sign. Now the halo sign will look kind of similar to this, except you'll have this, this grayish area surrounding our, our little fungal, fungus ball, okay? So that's the mycetoma. Now, aspergillus looks like this in its conidial form. Um, so 
it's actually named after this little device called the aspergillum, which is what uh, priests use to disperse holy water. Um, so it's actually named after that. Um, the, the device does not get its name from the fungus, and it looks very similar. Now, when it's in mold form, you see this acute angle branching. And the way I like to remember it is aspergilla starts with A, and so does acute angle. This is commonly given on step one. The treatment for ABPA is just prednisone. For mycetoma, it's elective surgical removal. If they're having hemoptysis, you need to remove it. Otherwise, you can just watch it. And for invasive aspergillosis, we go with voriconazole, one of our stronger azole antifungals. If you're dealing with a pregnant patient, however, you cannot give azole antifungals, so you would probably need to go with amphotericin B here. Blastomycosis occurs in non-immunosuppressed people. Um, so this is common in the central and southeastern United States. And Blastomyces likes to, like a lot of funguses, but particularly Blastomyces likes to develop in damp areas. So look for a patient coming in in the spring or summer, early fall. They're out, so outside, maybe they're in a lake or in a river. Uh, but water sports are associated uh, with this in endemic areas. The symptoms here are very nonspecific, uh, but what they'll have is like a pneumonia flu-like syndrome, and then they get these skin manifestations. Now, the skin manifestations of blastomycosis are very warty looking. So they can get pustules that ulcerate, but they tend to get these very warty-like lesions. Now, keep in mind, this is with disseminated blastomycosis. Um, so you're not always going to see it. Uh, they can also get osteomyelitis, but that's very rare. So what you're probably going to get on an exam here with blastomycosis is you've got a patient uh, who has got a pneumonia-like picture. Maybe they were diagnosed with community-acquired pneumonia, put on azithromycin or amoxicillin. They aren't getting any better. And then they uh, put in the vignette somewhere that this is somebody who is outside. It's the summer. They're playing in the river or whatever. Uh, the best initial step here because of the presentation is chest x-ray. Remember, we're doing our best, or our, our first step based on the presentation. And then once we start to narrow down our differential, we go for more specific tests. So the test of choice to hone in on blastomycosis is going to be sputum fungal stain and culture. Culture is always going to be the most accurate test, pretty much always. And the way I remember this is broad-based budding with blastomycosis. And I'll show you a picture of that. In mild disease, you can use itraconazole. In severe disease, so disseminated disease, or in immunocompromised people, or very importantly, in pregnant patients, because they cannot receive azole antifungals, we go with amphotericin B. And that's kind of a common theme with these fungal disorders. Very, very severe cases, we often go with amphotericin B. We try to avoid it, though, because it's nephrotoxic. This is the broad base budding. So notice how it's kind of buds off like that as opposed to like that. It's broad budding. So it buds in a broad way. And these are roughly the size of a red blood cell. This is one of the lesions that you can see. This is more of a sort of pustular lesion. This is the classic verrucous lesion that you see with blastomycosis. Coccidioidomycosis. I have a little bit of experience with this. I've had this. <laughs> so um, I was uh, on a, well, I'll, I'll get to the story. Uh, so this is a fungal disease that also occurs in the non-immunosuppressed. The culprit is Coccidioides immatus, which is endemic to the Southwest. So think of Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, maybe parts of Nevada, maybe Northern Mexico. Uh, what happens here is they get a little bit of a dry cough, pneumonia-like picture, but what stands out more is they get these joint pains, and then they get this rash where uh, often it's erythema nodosum in appearance, but it also may be these plaques that tend to ulcerate, and they look just really ugly. Uh, so when you've got a patient with a little bit of a cough and some small joint pains that's symmetrical and then rash, you really should be thinking coccidioidomycosis. And it's very likely on your exam that they're going to tell you that this is somebody in the Southwest, and that's just the dead giveaway. Now, 
uh, if they have meningeal signs, which is rare, then you want to do a lumbar puncture. Remember, we're treating the chief complaint or we're diagnosing the chief complaint. Um, but the test of choice is a specific test called coccidioidomycosis complement fixation. That is on CCS, so you may want to know that. Mild cases do not need treatment, but more severe cases, particularly those who are immunocompromised and pregnant patients, do get treatment. And that's going to be either with itraconazole or amphotericin B. What are we going to go with in pregnant women? Amphotericin B. We do not give azole antifungals to to pregnant women. They are teratogenic. So when I had this, um, I had lesions like this, and I am from Minnesota, so not the area that's uh, that, that's endemic for coccidioides. But I had been on a trip to Arizona. I um, was hiking near the Grand Canyon, and I came back, and yes, I had the joint pain, and I was tired, and I lost some weight, and uh, then I started getting these lesions, and that's what caused me to go in and see my doctor. I was only 17, so I had no idea what was going on. And they didn't know. They checked me for lupus. They checked me for cancer. <laughs> they checked me for so many things. Then finally, somebody actually asked, have you been out of the country? I'm like, no, but I've been to Arizona. Boom. Got sent off to infectious disease. They made the diagnosis, and uh, that was that. So on step one, you may get this. Um, these are spherules, uh, and then inside them, there are endospores. So these are much larger than a red blood cell. Cryptococcosis pretty much only happens in immunocompromised people, causes cryptococcus neoformans. Typically, the way this shows up is a fever and a headache. Um, it looks like meningitis, but only about 20% of the time do they have the classic neck ache and meningeal symptoms. So it can be difficult to distinguish. This can also even cause pneumonia, but on your exam, it's going to be meningitis. This will be a patient with AIDS who has meningitis, cryptococcal meningitis. The test of choice here, of course, we're going with a lumbar puncture first because we mem remember we treat the chief complaint. We diagnose the chief complaint first. Um, and what you can do is get a cryptococcal antigen test on that on the CSF. Another thing you can do to diagnose fungal meningitis is look at the white blood cells. Instead of neutrophils, you're going to see monocytes. That's typical for fungal meningitis. Mild cases, we just go with fluconazole. However, if they're pregnant, immunocompromised, or if they have CNS symptoms, we'll go with amphotericin B and flucytosine, both. Um, and then we follow that typically by lifetime fluconazole, often because these are patients with HIV AIDS. And then you can do this India ink stain, not commonly done anymore. But what you see here is this halo, and that's because cryptococcosis, or the, the, the fungus, has a very, very waxy big capsule. Okay, finally, histoplasmosis. So this can uh, show up in healthy people. Uh, it'll often be a very mild pneumonia in healthy people, but in, uh, in immunocompromised people it can disseminate and this can be very, very bad. Um, so this is endemic to the Ohio and Mississippi River Valleys near where I grew up, um, classically associated with spelunking, cave diving. In healthy people, it will it may be at worst a pneumonia that may get checked out. You give amoxicillin or azithromycin, it doesn't get any better. Uh, because it's fungal in origin. In immunocompromised people, it disseminates. You get palatal ulceration, systemic signs, um, they can even get anemia. So to diagnose this here, they're coming in with pulmonary signs, you get a chest x-ray. Um, if you're dealing with an immunocompromised person, you need to think histoplasmosis, so then get serology. Uh, with a chest x-ray, um, it can be pretty nonspecific. It may be nothing. You may see diffuse infiltrates. You may see ca uh, cavitary lesions, but you should always be thinking histoplasmosis and a patient coming in with pneumonia uh, who's immunocompromised. The most accurate test is sputum culture, but serology is going to be really good, and that'll probably be the right answer on your exam. The treatment, if they're healthy and asymptomatic, no treatments needed. Rarely is that going to come up on your exam because they don't give you asymptomatic patients on USMLE. If there's mild symptoms or they're immunocompromised, you can do itraconazole. If they have severe symptoms, presumably immunocompromised as well, or if it's disseminated, or if they're pregnant, you have to give amphotericin B. Again, no amphotericin B in pregnant patients. So this is kind of these this diffuse infiltrating pattern. It's pretty nonspecific. I mean, this could just as easily be a walking pneumonia. 
And then this is narrow based budding, unlike blastomycosis where you have the broad based budding. Notice how kind of narrow it is there as it buds off. So this is just a comparison. This is the distribution here. Notice coccidioidomycosis, I was right there <laughs> when I got it. And then uh, blasto and histo as well. And then this is everything we went over.